I'll just switch over to something entirely different, um, which is, uh, again, some precision oncology. Uh, and this is together with colleagues from ETH and Zurich and Dan Brown. Um, so uh, precision oncology, so we try uh, for a cohort of ca cancer patients um, to, uh, again, in literature retrieval um, as our, our key task. So the idea is we have these patients, uh, we have a bunch of tests, uh, results, we know a bit of demographics, and interestingly, we know um, results of the genome screening. So we know the genome mutations of the cancer. So not necessarily the whole genome of the host, but we know how the cancer is, so the diff between cancer and host, I guess. Um, and the idea is, taking this information, uh, can we um, recommend literature, but then also later treatments uh, for, for this particular patient. Um, and this is interesting, uh, just because there are a lot of synonyms out there, uh, a lot of people working in clinical decision support have been uh, looking into query expansion, things like that, so we're trying to do something like that here. Um, so we ended up playing around with these GANs. Um, so the, the general idea with GANs is you have two components, right? So two neural networks playing this game. Uh, one is making up data, the other one has to say is it real or fake. Right? So you co-train these things and you get some nice properties out of that. So you'll see a bunch of ways in which you can use GANs for this kind of problem here. And some of these properties are quite neat, others are not quite where we want them to be. Um, but I think they have some, some interesting um, features. Um, and that's in particular, so the, the driving idea behind this, and this turned out to be a horrible idea for wanting to do this in track, where we designed this for. So this is the recipe for not doing well in track 2017 for precision medicine. Um, was, oh, we have all these genes, so we know that this person has the following three mutations. Probably exact matching is pretty easy. What if we uh, do query expansion? So you may not have this mutation, but there's this other mutation. It also has something to do with breast cancer, although it may functionally be similar. So why not recommend that as a soft match for this uh, query, which is the patient here? Um, uh, the, the relevance judging criteria of the track turned out to be they want exact matching, so this is exactly how you uh, destroy the system performance, but I think in, in practice it may have some interesting uses. Um, so we'll do uh, two models and three applications fair enough. So uh, we have the standard literature retrieval one, so the patient is to query, um, and especially this genome profile, uh, and we want to rank literature articles again for PubMed. The, um, next one is similar, but it also wants you to recommend treatments for that patient. Right? So can we give a ranking over what is a possible cure for this uh, particular type of cancer, and especially for this genomic makeup um, of the tumor. Um, and then number three here is a bit of a, a moonshot, I guess, is can we discover new gene-to-gene -gene interactions? So having seen many pairs of genes, mutations co-occurring within patients or within papers, um, can we uh, discover new hypothetical mutation patterns that may also be out there? Um, and it turns out that works quite well. Um, so, the first model, uh, what we call GeneGAN here, it's very simple. So we have our query on the one side, which is the patient information, um, which contains some gene A or a group of genes that we call A here. Um, and we have our document uh, that is patented for ranking that also mentions some genes. We just use the discriminator of the GAN that we trained here, so one of these two components, and we just let that thing say how likely are these two to co occur within a patient, right? So if these are things that uh, often co occur, we'll give this a high score. We'll use these documents that have maybe not an exact match, but with such a soft match for that uh, patient. Um, and then the next one uh, is what we call the treatment GAN here for this uh, treatment prediction task, um, and this has basically two scores that we're computing um, in order to, to rate whether treatments are valid or are promising for certain kind of, uh, patients. Now, um, there's uh, one way of doing this is by saying, give me all the patient information, now use that to predict um, likely treatments, and then I compute the cost and similarity between these predicted and the treatments that are contained in the document. Uh, and then the other one is to simply uh, using again the discriminator say, again, following this dashed line here, give me the patient information, so the genetic makeup, 
um, the vector of treatments discussed in the, in the paper, and again, give me a score that describes how good of a match these two are. And then we basically use both of these scores in order to quantify uh, the quality of the match between query, which is patient, and literature. Okay. Um, I hope you can see these tables, otherwise you'll see them at the Google poster over there that I somehow have to bridge from the red poster, we'll see how that works. Um, so we basically uh, take a TFID and vector space model, um, and when comparing that model raw to uh, that model with the output of this GAN just now, just in a linear fusion, we can see that, uh, that most metrics here are improved by, uh, by quite a decent margin uh, when we add this, uh, these GAN scores on top. So that was encouraging. Now, for the second case, when we uh, do treatment prediction, we're looking at two scenarios. So the first two rows here will show you uh, predicting treatments together also with the medication. So not just which class of treatment, but also which concrete med. So a much, much harder problem. You also see that the scores are much lower than in the, in the bottom part. Um, and here you can see that the addition of these scan scores uh, approximately doubles recall while keeping precision pretty, uh, pretty static. Um, and for the, for the bottom part, for the much easier treatment prediction problem, it doesn't really do anything. I mean, your numbers switch uh, around a bit, but it doesn't really get better or worse. Now, uh, the final and most interesting problem here was this interaction discovery, so this true generation of mutations. So as, um, what we tried to do with this was hypothesis generation for biomedical researchers, right? So can we give them promising mutation patterns that they haven't seen in, in real life, but they may want to look for uh, in these uh, genome screening panels? Um, and what you can see here is quite interesting. So uh, in order to get our training data for our GAN, we kept the occurrence frequency of these mutation patterns. So we said everything that, don't, that we don't at least observe in 100 patients, we will not include in training. So we train on this. Um, and you can see that a lot of the false positives that our generator produces actually fall right to the right side of this frequency cutoff. So these are things that the generator has never seen for training, but that it predicts correctly um, because they fall just out of that. So many patients have these, and they are just counted as false positives because they were in the data set. So this is really, really interesting. Um, again, I guess most of us are not uh, precision oncologists, but I will anyway very, very briefly talk you through three examples um, that, we, uh, that we drew out of this. Um, the first pair here, this BRCA1 and WRM, um, are both genes that are quite directly related uh, to the formation of breast cancer. So that's a, that's a very, very simple pair here where you can say, well, having the one uh, very likely means that you may also develop the other, um, or at least that it's functionally quite similar. Now, the, um, the second pair here um, is similar. Um, so again, uh, so these are genes that have um, a very, very similar uh, function. Now, the third pair here, this puzzled me for a long while, and then we had to actually talk uh, with a few of our, of our pathologist friends um, that explained to me um, that while these two genes, so one is, in, um, is uh, related with bone formation um, and the other one has something to do with ovarian breast cancer, so they're not extremely related, but as it turns out, there's now very late research that says that somehow these genes are overloaded with information that does something with each other. So there are a bunch of studies out there um, that weren't even published by the time that we trained this, this model that said, well, there may be a connection. So, and I think that's also the message to, um, to understand here. Take this with a whole shaker of salt. Um, this is clearly not the oracle that we want to use to, uh, to guide all of our studies, but there may be some And um, uh, I guess the interesting outcome of this was exactly what we were aiming at, so going away from exact matches towards this idea of soft matches that gave us what we were hoping for, improvements in recall. Um, clearly, this is a very early, um, early study. Uh, we would have loved to play with a larger collection, especially of patient data. So we trained this multiple times, um, once on patients for whom we know all the mutations they have and the phenotypes of which type of cancer they have. Um, and then once again with papers, so studies that describe people, cohorts of people and their mutation profiles. Um, the behavior is quite simple. Um, and we're now trying to set up a prospective study in which we actually use, especially this third component here, this generator, um, in order to to predict new possible interactions that we may not have seen um, in, in our data set. Um, 
Thank you for your attention. And while I have you here, because we are a bit early, shamelessly using this for talk, if this kind of research is interesting, um, Ruben, Ryan, and myself will host a workshop at Wisdom in Houston next winter. Um, and here's the URL for that. Thanks a lot.